Hello there, welcome to Showcase. In RS, Istanbulites have a new address where they can absorb an eclectic mix of artworks. And as Alijan Pamir observes, the venue's debut exhibition offers visitors a bouquet of human stories. RS Art Space is on a mission to attract people to Üsküdar and turn the Asian side of Istanbul into an art center. That's why its first exhibit is about people, its human stories, and brings contemporary artists working in various methods from painting to collages together. And the themes range from existentialism to memory. The curator's approach was precisely to gather the artworks that hone in on the human experience. The human experience obviously is something very fundamental for every human being as well as for every artist because art is a field of sharing experiences, of creating experiences and maybe sometimes giving alternative insight in known experience. So art is always going beyond the known. And these four artists in our exhibition actually show different approaches to telling a story. So people's stories is actually on the one hand showing the richness of today's figurative contemporary art. Um, it shows various aesthetic and formal uh, ranges from uh, traditional oil on canvas to um, uh, 3D printed sculptures and collage. Uh, and if you look at the works, you can see that some artists are dealing with memory and stories from the past, like Didem or Haidar. Some of them are dealing with um, the interconnection bet between individual stories and official history. And actually we can see that, uh, especially if you connect it to experience, countless stories and countless experiences actually form the great narration that we call history. As for the inspirations behind the stories, nature has played a pivotal part. My art is based on storytelling, so the topic was great fit for me. Uh, I focused on the inner stories we tell ourselves and how we express them. The way I look at it is, if we approach these stories we carry within us with compassion, that way of seeing would transform our engagement with the world around us. Um, I used flowers and birds as symbols of compassion approach. Um, I think communication is the key to building bridges on the way to healing our broken world and that communication starts within us. Uh, my works here each tell stories on that road. For other artists at the gallery, the stories came from a more personal place. Looking at family albums, I realize people abandon their personal memories. And I approach all stems in my work as contemporary archaeology to tell how personal memory fades unless you are world famous. Filiz Yilmaz, the mind behind the art space, and her team say the exhibition is just one part of RS's humane mission. They say their gallery aims to popularize the concept of artworks as gifts, so that anyone can become an art collector. They also aim to launch an academy to help kids and aspiring artists, with hopes that art in Turkey will have a permanent human connection. Alijan Pamir, TRT World, Istanbul. One of Istanbul's most famous landmarks, the Maiden's Tower, has reopened to visitors after a two-year restoration. Let's take a look. Even for those who have never visited Istanbul, the Maiden's Tower is a landmark they would easily recognize. It's been around since 410 BC. Although there are many legends tied to the tower, it was actually used for trade and military purposes. The structure was restored numerous times and the latest rebuild 
has been quite extensive. When we look at the history of the Maiden's Tower, we see different versions of it. Because starting the restoration, we examined the restoration work done in 1944. The original parts of the structure that remained from that time were the tower and the castle. All the other parts you see outside the building and the castle are additions made later. Many of these additions are not faithful to the original design. Apart from the additions, the materials that were used in previous restorations have also caused many issues. We especially do not favor the usage of concrete, as the chemicals and salts in concrete damage the original walls and materials. Over time, this causes damage and wear. Similarly, it disrupts the static calculations made thousands of years ago. In the restorations of the 1940s, the static structure was damaged because of excessive use of concrete. The structure has been reinforced and the final design of the tower has been completed to resemble the form of the building as it was in the early 19th century. Visitors can stroll around the courtyard and climb the tower for a spectacular view of Istanbul. And after nightfall, they can enjoy the view of the tower itself as it's lit up with a laser and light show. British architect Norman Foster has spent 60 years pushing the boundaries of technology with iconic buildings around the world. But as he reveals in a major retrospective, he doesn't focus on what he's done so far, but instead looks to the future that he hopes will be cleaner, safer and more fun. From the London Gherkin to the Berlin Reichstag, Norman Foster has designed many famous structures during his career. He received the Pritzker Prize for his significant work in 1999. Now, at the age of 87, he is the subject of a major retrospective at the Pompidou Center in Paris. When you bring that work together with the other inspirational elements, you can see connections which you would not see if you were just perhaps um, looking at one project in isolation. But overall, I'm more excited by the future than I am by the past. Foster hopes that cities in the future will be better than they are now. He hopes for a green, quiet, healthy, safe and fun environment. And he thinks AI isn't a solution for that future design. We're social animals and also the thing that makes us different from all the other species is we make. We, we live in a world which is, which is physical. We inhabit buildings, streets, squares, so the two that synergy, um, in the end, that physicality, uh, you can't replicate by artificial intelligence. 130 models of his projects, including airports, urban developments, public buildings and bridges, alongside hundreds of sketchbooks, drawings and photos taken by Foster himself, during his six-year career, are all on display. We designed themes which allowed us to organize his work, his 60 years of production. It was a very large number of projects and so we were able to organize them, to choose them in order to give a comprehensible public access through these themes that punctuate all of his work, such as high-rise buildings, airports and all means of circulation and mobility. The curator of the show adds that, although technology and ecology are usually opposed, for Norman Foster, who is often seen as a pioneer of the high-tech trend, the two are inseparable. Visitors can see Foster's work until August and get a better idea about his projects that balance technology and the outside world. The Berlin Design Week is on full swing, and artists from across the world are showing off their contemporary versions of traditional designs. It's a calendar highlight for the design industry, and in this edition of Berlin Design Week, the Association of Portuguese Ceramics has taken up a large plot in the exhibition space. 
Although China and Italy are large ceramic exporting countries, for the marketing director of these ceramics, Portugal also has a lot to offer. We are here to promote the ceramic, to promote our diversity, our art of possibility, that we mix the heritage, the culture of Portugal ceramic, the know-how of Portugal ceramic, with modern installations, modern units of production, and most of all, the design, contemporary design, to use in every houses, in restaurants, hotels, all over the world. As for Berlin-based Peruvian artist Cindy Valdez, natural shapes and colours inspire her works. She often draws on traditional designs from her home country, but her production method is 3D printing. All our designs are inspired and shape of biodiversity and organic shapes, so we find new aesthetics that we want to present to the public. For example, this, and you can use it like this. And this way we want to get biodiversity and natural more presence in interior rooms and in tableware. And these colourful earrings are named after the town of Idria in Western Slovenia. I present here um, Slovenian cultural heritage. It is um, jewellery made it with uh, metal thread and it is very special in Slovenia. It is uh, Idria lace uh, and uh, we have a very famous uh, and old traditional school, Idria Lay School. Most of the events and exhibitions at the Berlin Design Week are free. For those who want insight into the latest trends and innovations in the design world, this place might be a great start. Russia's traditional headdresses, known as kokoshnik, have many different types. But now a designer has come up with her own way of carrying on a custom. Historically, a kokoshnik is a headdress worn by married women in Russia. It's a tradition that goes back to the 10th century and still remains a centerpiece of Russian dance ensembles and folk culture. As for this kokoshnik, it's the work of Siberian designer Olga Pashkina. But she likes to give her headdresses a modern twist, and for that, she's been criticized. Pashkina is actually a teacher of art and drawing by education, and until 2016, she worked as a furniture and graphic designer. Then she became fascinated with kokoshniks after attending a masterclass on props, and that's what brought her fame. I'm often criticized for the historical inaccuracy of this headgear. I would like to say that my kokoshniks, they are more fantasy, designer ones. I, as an artist, see it this way. Well, in general, people get to understand that this is a kokoshnik, although it is not historically true, not the same as it used to be worn in old Russia, but for a photo shoot, for B2 contests. It is beautiful and in demand. Pashkina makes only three to five headdresses per year. She sees it as a hobby, not a full-time job. And her art education proved handy when coming up with ideas for new kokoshniks. Since I have a degree in arts, I know the paintings of Russian masters. I always like the way they depict women in kokoshniks. And I even had a kokoshnik of a snow maiden, which was very reminiscent of Rubel's painting, The Swan Princess. So I took inspiration from the paintings of artists. Her headdresses are particularly popular among fashion photographers and participants of beauty contests. She approaches everything creatively and uses beautiful, interesting materials. This is not just a costume that is made according to a sketch, it's a costume in which the soul is invested. Traditionalists might not be happy with Pashkina's work, but she sure has her fans. For now, she's not making many kokoshniks, though considering the growing interest in her eye-grabbing pieces, that might soon change. Jordanian trader Abdullah Sakija comes from a long line of jewelers. 
For many generations, the family has been trading and designing jewellery from their various stores across the kingdom. Four generations of the Sakija family have been working in this profession. Our grandfather started working in this profession in Jafar. The following generations continued working in this profession when we moved here in Jordan. Thank God that we are the biggest family working in jewellery in Jordan and the Arab world. The Sakija family has the biggest number of stores in Jordan. The Fox piece is the most important model in all over the world. This is the most sold piece among all our international companies. I saw this piece worn by many people, including influencers. Therefore, I decided to come and see it. It is really beautiful. Hong Kong's oldest neighborhoods used to be filled with tens of thousands of neon signs. Citing safety concerns, the city is now removing the lights, which many see as heritage. Colorful neon lights have been a symbol of Hong Kong for decades. They used to advertise everything from restaurants to jewelry shops. There weren't many regulations when the signs first came into use, but today, most of them are taken down and one conservationist is fighting to preserve at least some. Cardin Chan is the general manager of Tetra Neon Exchange, or TNX, an organization that is working to collect the lights at an open-air storage yard. Of course, like, um, I, I was hit by like, waves of emotion. Um, it was sad for me to see the signs need to actually come, be removed or come down. Uh, they could no longer be seen in, the na in its natural habitats, which is the, the streets, right? Or, or attached to the original pre-war building. Uh, but I think um, as a consolation, at least we could actually keep, give them a home instead of like uh, seeing them or witnessing them being trashed or being demolished or being um, destroyed completely in the scaffolding, uh, which I witnessed before. Chen talks to shop owners and tries to convince them to donate the lights to TNX when they can no longer keep them up on the buildings. I, I would like them to stay in their natural habitat as long as possible. I always told them, don't donate them to us uh, unless you really have to, because that's not... Um, it, it makes me feel sad like to see our streets being without them. A sign on a pawn shop is TNX's latest acquisition. It depicts a bat clawing a coin and had to be taken down due to its size. The news of the removal quickly spread on social media and many people showed up to see the sign off and record its final lights. I'll, I'll be very sad to see the sign come down. Um, it's. Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, it's very warm, welcoming colours um, and it represents uh, the long history my family has with Hong Kong um, and the culture and, uh, and you know, simply partnership with the people for prosperity. Many say that these signs have been a part of Hong Kong's visual history and Chan hopes to open a museum one day where they could remain on permanent display. From London to Berlin, there are many street art destinations around the world. And now, Baghdad can be added to that list, all thanks to a group of artists 
Givendale City an artistic makeover. This is Baghdad's Al Qadimiya neighborhood. Residents say it was once neglected. But the murals have transformed the area so much that it's now even drawing tourists. Ali Khalifa is one of many street artists who decorates the walls of this historic area of the Iraqi capital. Our message is to make Baghdad a tourist landmark for such kind of art, street art, which as you can see has been accepted by local people and they like it. Because it is a new kind of art, we are continuing to raise awareness through these murals, along with folkloric and aesthetic paintings. The artists are a group of volunteers called the Butterfly Effect. They are mostly self-funded, as some shop owners help with expenses when they commission paintings near their premises to attract shoppers. And residents seem delighted with the revamp. We became very happy when they started to draw these paintings in our area, which remind us of the old days and the old houses which have been here for 50, 60 years. It is very beautiful and the street looks much better. People in Baghdad have been transforming the city's walls for years. They've reflected their opinions on the walls alongside political messages of peace and unity. Artists are now trying their best to unleash the potential of the city, which they call their beautiful home. The small Italian town of San Leucho once thrived thanks to its silk industry, but now things aren't running quite as smooth. Here is more. Belvedere Palace in Italy used to be a summer resort for King Ferdinand IV. He had it transformed into a silk workshop in the late 1700s, an ambitious project which raised many eyebrows. The dream of a king because we have to go back to 1798 when Ferdinand IV, IV that was the King Bourbon uh, of Naples uh, and then became also King of Sicily, uh, decided to set up a fantastic uh, meal uh, related to the silk. Uh, this mill uh, was uh, a sort of a utopia because uh, uh, around the mill he built up uh, a, a, a small city uh, with uh, 3,000 inhabitants at the time and all of these inhabitants were, were involved into the business of silk. Today, most of the palace is a museum about silk production. Only one private silk laboratory remains. Although most of their raw materials come from China, Andrea Sabelli is trying to keep the tradition alive. We work uh, for, I mean, for all over the world. So we made some palace uh, in, in all the world, like the, the, the White House in, uh, in Washington, uh, like uh, something in, in the Kremlin, some chairs in, the, in St. Petersburg, or for the Pope, or for the uh, Italian uh, Quirinale, that is the resident of the, our president. When the mill first opened in the late 18th century, workers received good wages, accommodation and free education. Women had the same privileges as men. But the once thriving industry is now suffering because of lack of workers. Well, my sons, my two sons have not continued the family tradition, unfortunately. Because youths today look for something else. One went to Siena, he's left this town, and the other is a carpenter. Something he's passionate about. But the tradition ends here, unfortunately. It has not gone on. And as the workshop now hangs by a thread, 
What remains for the visitors are just a few small stores and a vibrant display of what the industry once was. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esther Adrist from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching and bye for now.